Hello and welcome to another Approaches in Psychology video. This is lesson two and today we're going to be looking at the behaviorist approach. As usual, we'll be looking through the key concepts followed by a couple of evaluation points and ending with some exam questions. Now, if you remember from the last video, The Origins of Psychology, the behaviorist approach came about at the beginning of the 20th century as a response to criticisms of Wilhelm Wundt. And it was pioneered, amongst other people, by John Watson, who you can see on the screen there. Now, if you can't remember that, or if you're not entirely sure about what I'm talking about when I say the origins of psychology or Wilhelm Wundt, then I would suggest that you go back and watch that video just to remind yourself, and the link to it will appear at the end of this one, but it should also be on the screen now. Now, every approach that you're going to cover in this chapter has a basic set of assumptions. And it's important to know what those assumptions are, because it will not only help you to understand the approach, but it will also help you to write the answer to exam questions without waffling. So, the basic assumptions of the behaviorist approach are as follows. Everybody is born with a blank slate, and all behavior is learned through interactions with our environment. That is the big one. Additionally, behaviorists believe that you should only study observable and measurable behavior, they're not interested in mental processes, which is why they rejected the work of Wilhelm Wundt. And you should only study these things in objective ways using lab studies. They also suggest that humans and animals all learn in the same way. And so they advocate the use of animals in their research, because if it works for a dog or for a rat or any other type of animal, then it also works for a human. And then finally, all learning occurs via one of two processes, and these are called classical conditioning and operant conditioning. And that is where we are now going to start. So classical conditioning is learning through association. And remember that sentence, it's a nice snappy answer to the question, what is classical conditioning? And it was first demonstrated by Ivan Pavlov, who is on the screen now. Now, classical conditioning involves one key concept, which is the fact that all around us, there are things that make us react, just instinctively. And these are called unconditioned stimuli. For example, a loud noise. They make us jump. Okay, so the loud noise is an unconditioned stimulus, and the jumping or the fear that we experience is an unconditioned response. Nobody taught you to be afraid of a loud noise. It is just the way that it is. Now, classical conditioning occurs when we learn to associate a previously neutral stimulus with a stimulus that already produces a response, an unconditioned stimulus. And then through regular pairing, the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus, which then produces a new learned response which is called a conditioned response, okay? So just let that sink in for a sec, and if you want to pause the video to do so, then that's fine. Um, we're going to go on to Pavlov's research, and I'll show you what I mean in action. But just so that you've got it for now, that is a nice little two-mark answer that quickly describes what classical conditioning is. But let's move on and have a look at his research, and then it will become a little bit clearer. So, Pavlov tested his theory using dogs. Now, Pavlov noticed that when dogs are presented with food, they begin to salivate, they begin to drool. And that's because food is an unconditioned stimulus, and the salivation is an unconditioned response, because nobody teaches you to drool over food. It just happens. It's a biological response. So what he then did was he proceeded to present the dogs with food at the same time as ringing a bell. The bell is a neutral stimulus because it doesn't do anything. But over time, through repeated pairing, the dogs started to associate the sound of the bell with the food. So the neutral stimulus was presented at the same time as the unconditioned stimulus. And that then resulted in the dogs drooling at the sound of a bell, even when there wasn't any food present. So what had happened was, is that the bell, the previously neutral stimulus, had turned into a conditioned stimulus. And the salivation, 
now has become a conditioned response because they have learned to drool at the sound of a bell. Okay, so Pavlov demonstrated that repeated exposure to an event leads to a learned and uncontrollable behavior. So in this case, the dog learned to drool at the sound of a bell. Now, this is what it looks like very simply. It's an important process, so make sure you understand it. Um, so you might have to go over it a couple of times just to make sure that you've actually got it. And just to give you an example of another piece of research that used classical conditioning, there is the Little Albert study by Watson and Rayner, where researchers conditioned a baby to be afraid of a white rat. So what they did was they introduced a rat to the room where the baby was sat, and every time Albert reached for the rat or even noticed the rat, they would bang a hammer on a metal pipe behind him, obviously frightening Albert. And after a while, Albert started crying whenever the rat was introduced, even without the loud noise. So in this case, the rat was a neutral stimulus, but because it had been paired with an unconditioned stimulus, which was the loud noise, over time the rat became a conditioned stimulus, which then produced the conditioned response of fear. Okay, so Albert had learned to associate the loud noise with the rat, and so became afraid of the rat. Okay, so moving on, um, developing these ideas, we have B.F. Skinner, who you can see on the screen there, and he suggested that behavior is a result of learning through consequences, and that is called operant conditioning. Now, Skinner conducted research into operant conditioning using rats, and he found that there are three types of consequences that affect behavior. You've got positive reinforcement, which is adding a pleasant consequence. You've got negative reinforcement, which is removing an unpleasant consequence, which is obviously also a reward. And then you've got punishment, which is something bad. And he found that behavior that's reinforced will be repeated and learned, whereas behavior that is punished will die out. Okay, so in his research, he created what's called the Skinner Box. And in the Skinner Box, the rat would move around the cage, and when it accidentally pressed a lever, it would be rewarded with a food pellet. And then through that positive reinforcement, the animal would learn that each time it pressed the lever, it would be rewarded with food. And so the animal learned to press the lever because it was going to get rewarded. Okay, and that's kind of the diagram of what it looked like. And you could test a whole load of different stuff. So as you can see, there's an electric grid on the bottom. So you could test punishment as well. So every time the rat pressed the lever, you could give it a little electric shock. And then it would learn to not press the lever anymore. Because punishment means that the behavior dies out. Okay. So just be aware, Skinner's rats and Pavlov's dogs, they're both very, very important pieces of research and you could be asked to outline those. So just make sure that you are happy with what they did and what they found. Okay, equally, you need to be aware of classical conditioning and operant conditioning um, and kind of the processes that are involved with that. One word of warning, please don't get confused between negative reinforcement and punishment. A lot of students get the two mixed up. Negative reinforcement is a reward, whereas punishment is not. Okay, so just make sure you can keep those two apart. Okay, so that is the end of the outline, and we are going to very quickly go through some evaluation points. I've got four for you, um, and we'll just have a quick look at those before having a look at a six-mark outline. So we have a strength of the behaviorist approach, and that is that they have increased the scientific credibility of psychology. Okay, so the experimental methods that were used by people like Pavlov and Skinner that rejected the emphasis on things like introspection, but encouraged a more objective and measurable dimension of research that hugely impacted the scientific credibility of the approach. Okay, they used lab studies, they used well-controlled research, and they also broke behavior down into basic stimulus response units, which meant that they could kind of get rid of extraneous variables and really allowed them to kind of look at the cause and effect relationship between two things. 
Okay, so for example, Skinner was able to quite clearly demonstrate how reinforcement influenced behavior. Okay, so all of that helped psychology great, gain credibility and status as a scientific discipline. Okay, so they had a big impact in that sense. However, a counterpoint is that behaviorists quite clearly do oversimplify the learning process. Okay, they reduce the behavior to very, very simple components and they ignore a very important influence on learning, which is human thought. Okay, so because of that, there are other approaches that have kind of emerged, such as social learning theory, which you'll learn about in the next video, and the cognitive approach, and they draw attention to mental processes that are involved and their importance. So things like choice, just because I've learned a behavior because it's been rewarded doesn't necessarily mean that I am going to carry out that behavior because I may choose not to. Whereas the behaviorists say, we don't have any choice. If you've learned it, then you'll do it. Okay, so that suggests that learning is actually far more complex than observable behavior alone can account for. And that actually private mental processes are an essential part of the picture. But obviously the behaviorists don't like to study private mental processes because you can't see them. Okay, moving on, there is another strength of the behaviorist approach, and that is that it has real-life applications. So, for example, operant conditioning forms the basis of what's called a token economy system, and these are systems that are used in institutions like psychiatric hospitals and prisons where people get rewarded for desirable behavior with tokens, and those tokens can then be exchanged for rewards, like privileges. So the idea being that they're going to want to repeat that behavior and learn that behavior in order to get rewards. Equally, behaviorism has also helped us to understand mental illness. For example, a lot of phobias are now thought to be a result of unpleasant learning experiences. And that means that we've been able to develop therapies to help people who have got phobias. Therapies that involve things like exposing people to their phobias and therapies that attempt to recondition a patient's fear response. And then finally, some addictions as well, such as gambling, can be better understood through operant conditioning because the rewards of gambling could be seen as reinforcing the behavior. Okay? Just to be clear, there are lots of examples in there of how behaviorism has helped in the real world. You don't need to know all of them. Um, just choose a couple and write about those. And then, as a final limitation, you have the use of animal studies. Using non-human animals in research does have certain advantages because it gives experimenters more control over the process without, you know, demand characteristics or individual differences getting involved. However, the use of animals in experiments can be quite unethical because there is less concern about the protection from harm for non-human subjects. Very often they get subjected to fairly horrific environments and unfortunately um, a lot of them do get euthanized at the end, particularly at the time of Skinner and Pavlov. We are much more aware of animal research in this day and age, but back then it definitely was very, very unethical. Um, furthermore, you've got this issue of animal experiments may not be generalizable to humans because just because a rat does it doesn't mean that a human will do it. Okay, so therefore, things like operant and classical conditioning may provide an understanding of dog behavior or rat behavior, but it might not really tell us very much about human behavior. So you've got an issue with generalizability. So just to finish off then, I have a possible six mark outline for you. However, I will just put out there a word of warning. There are a lot of different ways that you could be asked to outline the behaviorist approach. So I'm going to put up some examples of the questions that you could get asked. But this is one example of a six mark outline. Okay, you've got a little bit of an introduction in the first paragraph. Then you've got classical conditioning and operant conditioning. What you'll notice is that I've not really used very much research. So I've talked about Pavlov a little bit in the second paragraph, but I've really, really condensed it down to the bare essentials. Equally, um, I've mentioned Skinner, but I haven't really said what he did. So I haven't mentioned the rats or anything. I've kind of kept it fairly descriptive with 
operant conditioning in that one. You could of course do it differently, but you need to make sure obviously that you don't spend too much time um, giving the examiner absolutely everything because you don't need to. Okay, that's about 175 words, which is a nice comfortable word count. Um, so you should be able to write something like that in the time that you're given. Now, like I said, there are a lot of different ways in which you could get asked to outline this. Okay, so you've got outline and evaluate classical and or operant conditioning, which is kind of, that's fine. But if you get asked to do one or the other, then you're gonna to need to increase the detail that you give. So if it's only classical conditioning, then I would definitely include Pavlov in your, in your outline. Equally, if it's only Skinner, then obviously I would include Skinner's rats as well. Um, outline and evaluate one or two types of conditioning, but then apply it to something. That's also fairly popular, so explaining why something has happened in a particular story that you've been given in the question, for example. One that students tend to trip up over a little bit is, is describe and evaluate the contributions made by behaviorists such as Pavlov and Skinner. So that question doesn't just require you to outline classical and operant conditioning, but it actually actively makes you think about what have we now got in psychology that we didn't have before the behaviorists. So yes, classical and operant conditioning are part of that, but it's also things like the focus on the objective and the measurable, the use of lab studies and all of that stuff, the scientific credibility that the behaviorists brought about is also something that you could talk about in your outline. Okay, so just make sure that when you're writing this, you are putting the focus on the correct thing. Um, but obviously, if it's quite broad, then it's kind of left up to you what you want to talk about. Okay, and that is the end of the video. It's been a slightly longer one than usual, so my apologies for that, but there is a fair amount to cover in the behaviorist approach to make sure that you understand everything. Um, I hope it's been useful and I hope it's been clear. If you have any questions, please pop them in the comment section below and I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for listening and I will see you in the next one.